I'm Elizabeth Karcher, and I'd like to welcome you to the Woodrow Wilson House. We're part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And today we have Dr. Aaron Chapman, who is a professor at George Washington University, who will be joining us to talk on our Tuesday noon June Zoom. This is our last Tuesday in June that we'll be having this uh, speaker series on suffrage. And so it's my pleasure to have her join us and uh, talk about this really important conversation about uh, Black women, suffrage, and citizenship. Um, as you know, the Woodrow Wilson House is located on S Street. Some of you have asked me if I'm actually in that room because you see behind me, this is a screensaver of the library at the Wilson House. Um, we are still closed to the public. We will be going back into the office to uh, start uh, getting ready to welcome visitors to come tour the house and tour the gardens. But for right now, we are still closed. We will let you know as soon as we're open and make it available to, um, to our guests. We, in the interim, have done, of course, this June suffrage speaker series. This started uh, back in February. It was supposed to take place at the Wilson House. And of course, under COVID, we've changed the platform to move it to be a Zoom uh, conference. We've had five speakers now in the month of June. It has been so successful and I thank all of you for tuning in and listening to this really great subject uh, about women's suffrage at the centennial of the signing of the 19th Amendment. Um, the conversation has actually evolved given all that's going on in the world today and uh, we are moving into a discussion about race and racism and Woodrow Wilson and his policies on, uh, on race and racism and um, the detriment that was to uh, America and what we the consequences that we're feeling now 100 years later. We're going to start that conversation in July and I welcome you to sign up. It will also be at noon. Our first topic, our first speaker will be Dr. Ellen, uh, Eric Yellen on racism in the nation's service. He'll be joining us on June, uh, July 14th. Once again, it's a Tuesday and it's at noon. Um, and there'll be more speakers joining us throughout the next couple of months. Um, in that vein, I ask you and uh, welcome you to please send us suggestions of speakers that you've heard that you think would be, uh, add something to the conversation at the Wilson House. So please send me an email and let me know about, or make an introduction to a speaker that you think would really add to the conversation at the Wilson House. Um, we're having conversations now and we're moving into action. Uh, but I think right now we've spent time listening and we're learning and having those conversations are, is really a very important step in, in, um, in changing who we are and what, how we see ourselves in America. Um, the Woodrow Wilson House, We'll be having some uh, tours. I've mentioned our, our uh, garden, our victory garden, which the herbs are growing. I saw two peppers, hot peppers, on a plant that's growing out in the front on S Street. Uh, we tell the story of Columbia and how that image of Columbia uh, so the seeds of victory has changed over the last century. We use the first poster that was used in 1918, and we so show that evolution of the Victory Garden, which started during Woodrow Wilson's uh, time in World War I, and how that's evolved to Michelle Obama growing a, um, a kitchen garden at the White House. And so you'll see that history of the last hundred years and uh, the importance of Victory Gardens, especially in today's times when there's instability, whether that's uh, in hunger or, or political unrest, people tend to plant a garden. Um, we'll also be having, uh, we'll be starting uh, tours that you can do outside. We realize that it's not easy to go into museums today. So we are starting audio walking tours of the Embassy Row neighborhood, Calorama, DuPont, uh, Observatory Circle, and Sheridan Circle. Those uh, will be coming out in the next couple of weeks, as well as a tour on Wadi Butler Wood houses uh, that were, that's the architect who built the Woodrow Wilson house. Uh, the tour will be called something like If These Walls Could Talk. It's not just about the architecture, it's about the people who lived in these houses. So um, there'll be more to follow on that. They'll all be available online on our webpage. 
we are uh, going, undergoing some changes on our web pages. So if you've got comments or uh, suggestions, please send them on. We're working to make that a little bit more up to date uh, and contemporary. You'll also see the headline on our web page are statements from the National Trust and from Paul Edmondson about where we stand on Black Lives Matter and Black History Matters. So please tune in and look at our site um, to understand who we are as a bigger part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So with that, let me uh, mention or talk to you and introduce our speaker today. Um, I'd also like to say, uh, uh, Aaron, Dr. Chapman will give a talk. Right now your screens are all dark and you are muted. Uh, once her talk is over, you can open your screen and we'll be able to see you. Um, we have you muted right now so that we're, you're not a distraction as for her presentation. But once the presentation is over, we'll open it uh, for questions. I encourage you to send me questions. It's directed to Elizabeth Karcher here on, um, through the chat function on the screen. And I will then ask the, uh, uh, Dr. Chapman the questions that have come in and we'll keep the conversation going. So for the moment you're muted and you are, your screen is dark and that will change. You, you will be able to open your screen for us to see you once the conversation starts and send your questions in by chat, okay? Um, so with that, Dr. Aaron Chapman is an Associate Professor of History at George Washington University in Washington, DC. She holds a BA in history from Stanford University and an MA and PhD in African American studies and history from Yale University. Dr. Chapman is a scholar of race and sexuality in US culture and an historian of gender politics and radicalism in the 20th century black freedom movement. Her research has been supported by the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the American Association of University Women, the Schlesinger Library at Harvard University, and the American Council of Learned Societies. Dr. Chapman is the author of Prove It On Me, New Negroes, Sex and Popular Culture in the 1920s, which came out in, in 2012, and a range of books, book chapters and articles. These include a chapter on the New Negro Renaissance in Keywords for African American Studies, which is published at New York University Press in 2018, and Staging Gendered Radicalism in the Height of U.S. Cold War, A Raisin in the Sun and Lorraine Hansberry's Vision of Freedom, which was published in August of 2017, issue of Gender and History. She is currently drafting a biography of Lorraine Hansberry to be published by Oxford University Press. Dr. Chapman serves the Academy at Large as President of the Board of Trustees of the Journal of Women's Literature History at George Washington University. She serves as a member of the Executive Committee of the Program in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and sits on the Searing Committee of the GW University Faculty Association. Dr. Chapman, Chapman teaches survey courses in African American history and graduate and undergraduate seminars on African American historiography, African American historical geography, biography, and history of slavery and its legacies and black radicalism. So with that, please welcome Dr. Erin Chapman at, from George Washington University on the subject of black women, suffrage, and citizenship. Thank you. Thank you so much and good afternoon. Um, I thank you all for joining me for this concluding talk of the engaging series on women's suffrage at the Woodrow Wilson House. And I thank Elizabeth Karcher and the other organizers for their great work in conceiving and staging these events. So with all of the turmoil reverberating through our society, the pandemic and its disproportionate impacts on the poor and on people of color, and the ongoing revelations of police brutality against people of color across the nation and the Black Lives Matter protests against these and other forms of white supremacist terror and the tumultuous presidential election season surrounding us with its increasingly polarizing partisanship that's dividing our society among other issues swirling around us. We might wonder why we should be attentive to the history of the movement for women's suffrage right now. <clears throat> 
those century old efforts, of the suffragettes in their long dresses and broad hats and white gloves seem almost laughably quaint, even perhaps irrelevant to the concerns facing women in our own time. So today I want to discuss some aspects of the history of the US women's suffrage movement that I hope will provide us some perspective on the racial and sexual politics that continue to shape our conversations and motivate the actions reported on the nightly news and structure our opportunities and possibilities. I'd like you to think with me about the race politics of women's suffrage. What did and does race have to do with women's suffrage or the larger question of women's rights or feminism? Why did black women support women's suffrage? What were the rationales and praxis that black women developed as they advocated women's suffrage? And what social and political pressures did they face as they practiced those politics? What was and remains at stake in suffrage and citizenship for black women? So first I want to look back at the earliest generation of black women suffrage advocates to consider the words and the reasoning of Sojourner Truth. I'll then go on to discuss Ida B. Wells Barnett's suffrage activism in the suffrage parade of March 1913 and beyond. So if Elizabeth could show the next slide, please. Thanks so much. Uh, so Sojourner Truth was born a slave named Isabella in about 1797 in upstate New York. Because New York was originally settled by Dutch colonists, Isabella's first language was Dutch and she spoke English with a Dutch accent rather than the stereotypical black Southern dialect that is so often attributed to her. Nevertheless, she experienced the hallmarks we associate with slavery, backbreaking work in agricultural and house work without remittance, the exploitation of her productive and her reproductive capabilities, sale from one owner to another and the consequent fracturing of her family, she was sold away from her parents when she was young and later her children were sold away from herself. So the dehumanization and dispossession wrought by the white supremacist patriarchy of her time. Isabella was emancipated by New York state law in July, 1827. She was thought to be 30 years old and that's when you were emancipated under New York law. Slaves had to reach the age of 30. In 1843, prompted by religious rebirth and personal self-determination, she renamed herself Sojourner Truth. Her new name symbolized her quest. She would go sojourning after religious, moral, and political truths. Sojourner Truth was thereafter an itinerant Pentecostal preacher, a spiritual singer, and an advocate of the abolition of slavery, of women's suffrage, and of black women's rights. In 1867, two years after the culmination of the Civil War, Truth attended a national conference of the Equal Rights Association. This group was an outgrowth of the black and white abolitionist networks that had formed in the 1830s and 1840s. In the years after the Civil War, these groups had sought to secure emancipation and black citizenship by ensuring the freed people's access to the vote and had also sought to extend the potential social revolution of emancipation by calling for women's suffrage. But by the time Sojourner Truth attended the conference of 1867, the organization had broken down into factions. One faction prioritizing the expansion of male suffrage to include black men and the other advocating votes for women. Those like the eminent black abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who supported women's suffrage but prioritized black men's suffrage, argued that black men urgently needed the vote as a weapon to defend themselves against the rising tide of anti-Black violence in the nation. He argued that Black women would be represented and protected by Black men's citizenship and suffrage according to the established patriarchal model, and as white women were presumably protected by their husbands and fathers. On the other hand, those such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who prioritized women's suffrage, argued that middle-class white women, such as themselves, should have the vote before Black men due to their, quote, intelligence, which black men presumably lacked. They developed a rhetoric and rationale highlighting literacy, education, and morality as standards for citizenship and suffrage. So at the conference in 1867, Sojourner Truth pointed out the problems for black women with both of those positions. She referenced the majority of, quote, colored women who go out washing 
which is about as high as a colored woman gets. As a newly freed person, Sojourner Truth had worked as a washerwoman and a cleaner on the lowest rung of the wage economy. Thus, in her speech at the 1867 meeting, she stood on her own ground, that of the newly freed black working woman and constructed her women's suffrage arguments from there. So the next slide, slide please, Elizabeth. So Truth admonished the attendees of the Equal Rights Association Conference. You've been having our rights so long, she said, that you think, like a slaveholder, that you own us. The hour and the us Sojourner Truth represented in her 1867 speech was neither all women nor all black people. She characterized herself as one of the few, quote, going about to speak for the rights of the colored woman. So she spoke for the lowliest of her society, the black women who needed the protection of their own citizenship rights to contract their own labor, claim their own money and protect their own children. She emphasized that black women could not rely on black men's access to patriarchal citizenship to protect them. Since she had seen black men, quote, ask for black women's money and take it all, and then scold because there is no food on the table, she considered black patriarchy potentially exploitative of black women. Quote, if colored men get their rights and not colored women get theirs, there will be a bad time about it, she argued. Votes for black men would be insufficient protection for black women. They needed to have and hold their citizenship rights, their names, their labor, their reproduction, their votes for themselves. Speaking of her experience harvesting and binding grain, for which she was paid half as much as men doing the same work, Sojourner proclaimed, we do as much, we eat as much, we want as much. And what we want is a little money, money of black women's own, secured by their independent rights. Unlike those of white middle-class women, Truth's claims to suffrage and citizenship were not based on intelligence or literacy or morality, money, work, and need. That's why suffrage was important for black women. Truth sought to craft a suffrage argument that would not demand black women choose between their blackness and their womanhood, as if they could make such a choice, it's kind of impossible but that would work to eliminate racism as well as sexism, that would endeavor to dismantle the system of white supremacist patriarchy built on the denial of freedom to women like her. Sojourner Truth's vision, however, was not upheld. Women's suffrage was not built as a praxis to challenge both white supremacy and patriarchy simultaneously. We can see some of the consequences of this for the following generations as we consider Ida B. Wells Barnett's experience of the 1913 suffrage march, the first such march during Woodrow Wilson's presidency. Ida B. Wells Barnett was born a slave in 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. She was the eldest of eight children. And when she was just 16, her parents died, leaving Ida to assume responsibility for all of her siblings. She supported herself and her siblings by working as a teacher, first near home in Northern Mississippi, and then nearby in the city of Memphis, Tennessee. However, her dream was to write professionally. She tried fiction. She wasn't very good at it. Uh, she gained a greater success through journalism. As a journalist, newspaper publisher, pamphleteer, and speaker, Ida B. Wells became famous, infamous really, for her fearless and uncompromising analysis of lynching, not as punishment for black men's accused black men's accused rape of white women, but as a form of terrorism, white supremacists perpetrated on black men, women, and children in order to maintain black political and economic subordination. After threats on her life effectively exiled her from her home in Memphis, Wells, with the endorsement of an elderly Frederick Douglass, conducted an international speaking tour, drumming up support for her anti-lynching campaign and investigating new lynchings as they continue to occur across the United States. As of her marriage to attorney Ferdinand Barnett Jr. in 1895, Wells changed her name to Wells Barnett and made Chicago her home, home base. She continued her activism through anti-lynching, racial advancement, women's rights, and workers' rights. She helped to found the National Association of Colored Women and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The NAACP. 
She supported the first successful National Black Union, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Maids, and also defied military intelligence in her support for Marcus Garvey and his Black Nationalist Universal Negro Improvement Association. In Chicago, she founded a settlement house called the Negro Fellowship League and the city's first Black women's suffrage organization, the Alpha Suffrage Club. Wells Barnett founded the Alpha Suffrage Club in January 1913 as a nonpartisan means for Black women to participate in the reinvigorated effort to extend women's suffrage in Illinois and to block the segregationist initi initiatives the newly elected Democratic governor and state legislators were launching across the state. In this segregationist effort, the Illinois Democrats were following the lead of the National Party and of course of President Wilson, who imposed segregation on the city of Washington, D.C. and the various branches of the federal employment as one of his first acts as president. In Chicago, the Alpha Suffrage Club promptly set about raising money to support Wells Barnett's trip to Washington to join the National Women's Suffrage Parade as a member of the Illinois delegation. So here in Washington, on the morning of the event in 1913, as Wells Barnett and the rest of the Illinois women practiced their parade formation, the head of the Illinois delegation, Grace Trout, rushed in to inform them that she had been directed by the national event organizers to quote, keep the Illinois delegation entirely white. Wells Barnett was to be denied the opportunity to represent her state and relegated to the colored section of the parade. The delegation discussed the matter, but in the end, Trout insisted that, quote, if the National Association has decided it is unwise to include the colored women, we should abide by its decision. The humiliation of being excluded pained and angered Wells Barnett. The strong emotion she felt resulted in trembling and tears as she stated, the Southern women have tried to evade the question of the color line time and again by giving some excuse or other every time it has been brought up. If the Illinois women do not take a stand now in this great democratic parade, then the colored women are lost. Wells Barnett reasoned black women's cause would be lost for two reasons. First, there was the contradiction of a march for equal suffrage rights that would relegate black women to a colored section in compliance with a system of inequality. Wells implicitly demanded that the Illinois women take a principled stand against segregation and hold the line of racial inclusivity and equality as basic foundations for women's suffrage. Second, Wells Barnett also knew that many black men and women were suspicious of women's suffrage. Wouldn't the addition of women, the majority of them white, to the electorate potentially double the opposition to black equality? Wouldn't Jim Crow segregation exclude black women voters from the electorate in most regions of the nation just as it did black men? And if black women were allowed to vote, wouldn't that right compound black men's political emasculation? Indeed, the editors of the black newspaper, the Chicago Defender predicted that if women get the vote in America, the colored race will suffer further ills in legislation. Black women would be lost because the acceptance of segregation aligned women's suffrage with white supremacy and further invalidated black women's right to citizenship. Nevertheless, Wells Barnett's statement of protest fell on deaf ears, and she appeared to capitulate to Grace Trout's demands. She declared she would not participate in the parade at all if she could not march with the Illinois delegation and left the practice hall. However, hours later, as the parade proceeded through the streets of the capital city, Wells Barnett emerged from the crowd of spectators along the route, stepped into the marching line, and claimed her position among the Illinois delegation. In quiet commitment to the principle of equality the march should have upheld, she simply defied the segregation decree. Back in Chicago, over the course of the following two years, Wells Barnett succeeded in using the Alpha Suffrage Club to forward the interests of equality. The group joined with other black political organizations in Illinois to challenge two segregation bills and a set of anti-miscegenation bills that Democrats had proposed in the, in the Illinois state legislature. Wells Barnett helped organize a demonstration in which hundreds of black women converged on the state capitol in Springfield and wound through its halls to protest this racist legislation. All of the bills were defeated. 
The Alpha Suffrage Club next succeeded in assisting the Illinois women's effort to extend their right to vote in their home state. And later, the organization helped elect Chicago's first black alderman, Republican Oscar DePriest, who of course went on to become the first uh, black man to serve in the House of Representatives since Reconstruction. Please change the slide. So this event is one of commemoration. We gather to honor the hard work and success of the struggle for suffrage. Often, when a day of honor is declared to commemorate a movement, it is because the polity largely agrees that the movement is over. It's long dead leaders worthy of remembrance precisely because their work is concluded. As we know, the warriors in the battle for suffrage did ultimately win. The 19th Amendment forbidding restriction of the right to vote according to sex was ratified in 1920. 100 years ago. Two generations later, Black women's unfettered access to suffrage rights, as defined by the 15th and 19th Amendments, was finally secured with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, resulting in, uh, that resulted from the Black Freedom Movement. Yet, we cannot afford to be complacent, for there is much work still left to be done. We have witnessed many commemorations in recent years. In 2013, we celebrated 150 years since the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation, 50, 50 years since the 1963 Civil Rights March on Washington, 40 years since the 1973 Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision. In 2015, we celebrated 150 years since the passage of the 13th Amendment, completely eliminating slavery in the United States, and 50 years since the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. This year, we celebrate 100 years of US women's suffrage. And yet, each and every one of the freedoms and rights secured by the wars, social upheavals, and movements marked by those dates is in peril right now. Witness the voter suppression efforts during the current and recent election seasons, the mass incarceration and resulting disenfranchisement of Black and Latino people, the disproportionate prosecution and incarceration of Black women and other poor racialized women around issues of reproductive freedom, and the especially pernicious question of prenatal personhood. The ongoing rape, abuse, and murder of Black people, children, men, women, by police forces around the country. Through these means and others, the state still asserts its racist and sexist prerogative over the reproduction, labor, and humanity of Black people, especially poor women of color. In the most historically accurate version of her famous speech of 1851, Sojourner Truth declared, I am a woman's rights. The import of this enigmatic statement is debatable. I say, Sojourner meant that the most transformative and liberating of feminisms is built on the scaffolding Sojourner Truth provided, not on the backs of poor working class racialized women, but from their positionality. Not through simplistic inclusion or empty gestures of accommodation, but in mutual recognition and reciprocal collaboration. As a society, we've said and heard these lessons before. And we need to say and hear them again. We need to say and hear them until we really learn them, really accomplish the incisive liberation Sojourner Truth's words demand, because there are liberations yet to be won. The citizenship of so many still left insecure and unequal, and we cannot afford to commemorate past successes without looking forward to the work yet to be done. Thank you so much. Erin, that was great. That was really wonderful. I appreciate that. I think I've stopped sharing the screen and we, yes, we see everyone. So um, please start the chat. The questions have already started coming in. Um, I, uh, yes, the slides did get ahead of themselves, so I apologize. Um, uh, We've learned a lot today, including for me, on how to present <laughs> and share my screen. So, um, but, you know, one of the other things, and I mentioned this uh, in our talk yesterday, Erin, to me it's surprising, having gone through this for the last five weeks, um, there are a lot of names of people that I didn't learn about when I was in school. Mm. And I have to wonder, um, and, and now, because of this conversation on race, I also wonder, is it because I grew up in my education was 
different than someone else. So for instance, Ida B. Wells, I didn't really know about Ida B. Wells. I didn't really learn about uh, Sojourner Truth. To be honest, I didn't learn about Alice, Alice Paul either. These were names that I just didn't, that, that was not part of my education in school. Was it something that you learned as a elementary school or a girl in, in school growing up? No, not really. <laughs> I grew up in Dallas, Texas and uh, went to a very elite prep school there that was uh, majority white. And uh, no, I didn't. Uh, we talked about um, slavery in a very limited way um, and emphasized emancipation. And, um, and we talked about civil rights in a very limited way again, um, mm -hmm. focusing on Martin Luther King um, as if he alone were the embodiment of the whole movement. Right. Um, and so um, those were sort of isolated and um, only really highlighted in February, um, Black History Month. Right. And um, so no, it wasn't until I got to college. And also as I was growing up, um, I was involved in a number of other organizations beyond going to school. And so at church and in Jack and Jill, um, and through my parents' friends and connections, uh, I learned um, more about Black history and its complexity. But it really wasn't until I got to college and studied um, African American history in its own right um, through a professor, uh, Claiborne Carson, actually, um, and then uh, studied uh, women's history with Estelle Friedman that um, I really understood the nuances, right, and got to know those individual names and their contributions and the long history and complexity of uh, those movements and the various contributions to them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So one of the other questions that came in is, has the word or the concept of racism changed and evolved? We talked a little bit about this yesterday. Do you want to share uh, that conversation that we had? Yeah, I, I don't think um, yesterday, uh, John and I had a, had a conversation about whether or not uh, the definition of racism has evolved. And I don't think it's so much that the definition of racism has evolved as um, the larger society's awareness and acceptance of things as, as pra of practices and behaviors that were considered perfectly fine in the past by majority of society have become verboten as society has uh, begun to recognize, oh, you know, that's, that's bad behavior. <laughs> um, so I was, uh, I gave a version of this talk uh, years ago um, at George Washington uh, commemorating the 1913 march and um, sat next to a woman who presented on the organizers of the march and their rationale for segregating it. And um, she said that this was simply because black women were considered less moral, not as respectable, um, and that that wasn't racist, that that was um, the idea of the time. And um, somehow the idea of the time, since it was the contemporary broad view, was not racist. <laughs> so, you know, um, we had a, a discussion on the panel, you know, um, and I'm saying, well, that's precisely the form that racism took against black women in that period, right? That, that was the racism, the idea that black women were not as moral, were not as respectable, um, were not, didn't have access to the uh, status of ladies and weren't to be respected in that way. Mm -hmm. So, um, and cer certainly black women, Ida B. Wells at the time, for example, and other contemporaries were very clear that they were being discriminated against, that that was racist. Um, you know, the broader society didn't see it as such, of course. And I think that's part of the problem is that sometimes we don't recognize racist, even today, you don't recognize in yourself something that might be considered racist by someone else. Um, it's and part of it. And what we're, I, I think, uh, is having that discussion to say, no, actually, that's, that, that is, uh, that's, that's not right. You don't have, that is racism. You, your attitudes 
that might be what the public feels, but that is actually what racism is. So would you please speak about black organization around suffrage, um, including the National Association of Colored Women? Uh, what were their relationship with other national suffrage organizations? And would you also speak a little bit about the black suffrage leaders in the years right before the 19th Amendment, such as Mary Church uh, Terrell? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um... So the National Association of Colored Women uh, was founded in 1896, and it was a um, sort of a confluence of various organizations that had exist existed for about a generation uh, before they decided to bring them together to form a national organization. And um, Mary Church Terrell was its first president and was a longstanding president for two or three terms at the beginning of the organization and remained active in it. She was also active in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People um, and helped uh, found that organization. Um, Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells were not friends. <laughs> they knew each other, um, but they did not like each other. Um, Mary Church Terrell, um, one of her faults was, a, was that she could be snobbish. And one of Ida B. Wells' faults was that she could be extremely dogmatic. Um, and, you know, her view was the only view. And um, so they didn't get along. Um, and uh, so there were multiple organizations that fed into the National Association of Colored Women. And the Alpha Suffrage Club was one of them after um, Ida B. Wells founded it. Um, the, the NACW, um, had a difficult uh, collaboration, I'll call it. It wasn't really an alliance. It was a, a difficult collaboration with the majority white uh, suffrage organizations across the nation. Um, there, of course, was the, the Northern one and the Southern one. Um, and they um, had, had distinct ideas about Black women's inclusion, but neither one was fully inclusive. Um, so the NACW sort of set um, to the side and collaborated when it could um, with those organizations to the extent that, that they had um, um, alliances or common goals. Um, the NACW uh, had a goal of suffrage that was locality by locality. So in each individual place, um, say in uh, the state of North Carolina or the state of Texas or in Chicago or what have you. Um, they had specific goals that they wanted to accomplish with black women's suffrage. So I mentioned in Chicago that the Alpha Suffrage Club helped to get Oscar DePriest elected. They also moved against the efforts to impose segregation in the state of Illinois. Um, so these were important locally. And locally, they felt like it was important for Black women to have the vote to be able to actualize these issues. Um, now, the national NACW um, cared to a degree, right, saying that, yes, Black women should have the vote in principle to utilize the vote as they should, right, um, as they could in each locality for the advancement of the race. Um, the NACW um, would support those efforts with money and with speaking tours, people like Mary Church Durrell, who were national leaders, might be invited to come to the locality um, and give a speech, sort of rousing the women to action on their local issues. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a sort of a national clearinghouse for um, helping to support local issues on the ground. Does that make sense? I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, I, I also, that reminded me that, um, the we're part of the national trust for historic preservation and it's only by uh through uh support of the national trust that we have this movement now um and it's called where history where women made history and that's part of what sponsors uh, the National Trust and the talks that go on, in fact, in, even like this. And it takes little organizations, and even big ones like the National Trust, to support these conversations and keep it going, to make it, to make it grow even bigger. So um, a shout out to uh, Where Women Made History. Um, 
So uh, to what extent did access to education make a difference to black women voting? I believe this is coming from uh, uh, a viewer. It says, I believe white women also felt white men were not sufficiently educated to vote. What are your thoughts? Well, that's true. There was a, a class divide. Um, so it was a sense that, um, so for example, people like Susan B. Anthony resented the fact that um, working class white men who may not be literate, um, didn't necessarily have um, as much uh, uh, morality from their perspective, right? Um, they resented the fact that that working class white men could vote and they couldn't. Um, and they often made an argument that was based in kind of a class bias. You know, isn't it ironic? Isn't it silly? Isn't it ridiculous? You know, that this, you know, blundering oaf can vote where I can't. Um, and um, for working class white women, there was often the sense that um, the vote in itself wasn't necessarily the issue because um, there was that class divide and that sort of sense of, well, you know, these upper class or middle class women are advocating for the vote. They're not doing so necessarily um, for the betterment of our, say, union effort um, or our labor movement that we are supporting in our neighborhoods. Um, and there was also a great, uh, at the same time that women's suffrage was moving, there was the temperance movement that was happening. And temperance also had um, a sort of a class mandate around it, a sense that if, um, if women could get the vote, women meaning white middle-class women, then they could eliminate access to alcohol and it was primarily supposedly um, white working class men who were drinking and drinking up um, th their wages before their wives could get um, groceries and the other things that were needed for the house. And these were kind of stereotypes that moved through the temperance movement and that kind of thing. And so there were lots of reasons for white working class women to not feel that white middle class women necessarily represented their issues and uh, to not necessarily support the vote on their behalf. Um, and education, um, you know, factors in, but it's also the kind of education you need. You know, do you mean um, just literacy or uh, and numeracy, right? The ability to sort of add and subtract and uh, figure interest and those kinds of things, or do you mean um, the sort of broad sweeping liberal arts education that we think of, you know, and at the time that was reading the classics in the ancient Greek and in the ancient Latin, right? Um, and could you, um, you know, discourse on uh, various kinds of poetry and these kinds of things, right? Um, and that didn't matter for a lot of society, right? <laughs> Trying to work really hard um, to get food on the table. Um, so if you mean basic literacy, then that is important in terms of getting the vote. If you mean um, this kind of, you know, as people might say, highfalutin kind of education um, that is very elite, um, you know, that that in itself was a marker of class status or at least aspiration to a kind of class status um, that could be divisive. Um, we have a few questions, um, and we're going to come back to that because I think that's an important an important topic. But um, some I've got a number of people are are privately sending me a message that they are loving this talk. They're thanking you. They are amazing. Uh, you are amazing and they're happy that you are sharing. Um, uh, this is uh, Black Women Shiro's, which I love that. Um, <laughs> which I never heard. I like that, she heroes. Um, so one is, uh, Dr. Chapman, thank you for this insightful presentation. I wonder what ways have you witnessed the women's suffrage movement evolve, whereas the participants aren't practically uh, par participa par participating ethically? Um, and two, what references do you suggest to continue this much needed conversation with my colleagues who are culturally uh, communication pi communications pioneers and in the community at large. Um, the conversation, having this conversation is really important. So can you talk about that a little bit? 
Um, so can you reiterate the first part of the question? Um, yeah. What ways have you witnessed the women's suffrage movement devolve? Ah, uh, okay. Um, I don't know if it's so much a devolution as that it was always complicated, right? I mean, it's a, it's um, just like any phase or every phase of any movement, right? Um, it it has its its um, aspirations to wonderful um, high ethics and and moral um, pinnacles, right? Um, to be able to reach for full equality, for example. Um, but when you look more closely, often the individual advocates of the movement and and its activists, um, they have their own stakes in the in that question, right? Um, they have their own, um, they, they're sort of defending their own position, right? And that will result in some, some problematic, you know, sort of um, walls or divisions that, that can come up if they see, if it seems to them that their own position is compromised by somebody else's position, even if um, in a broad way, they are all seeking the same high pinnacle of equality or what have you. Some people um, say it's not a movement unless you've got two different, uh, you know, if you, if they don't disagree, is it really a movement? <laughs> you have to have two parties to have it be a movement. <laughs> you know, I, do you agree with right. that? Um, I, I think that history certainly bears that out, <laughs> um, that when you look closely at, at anything, absolutely anything, you know, you find that people within that movement disagree um, to some extent or another, and they might have divided into um, discrete factions, or maybe it's just sort of a chaotic disagreement, <laughs> but they, they do have um, places in which they, you know, they, they have problems with uh, one another, and maybe it's just personality, or maybe it has to do with these kinds of um, sort of principled stances. Right? Are we going to support this? How are we going to support this? Uh, I don't want to support that. That's not part of our movement, et cetera. So that comes into our next question, and it's connected to your point of analysis and focus on positionality. And uh, this comes from Kate, and she says, I wonder if you can say a few words about collab collaborative leadership in the founding of Black Lives Matter and the National Women's Studies Association. Oh, interesting. Yes, um, so uh, Black Lives Matter has um, been very uh, deliberate in trying to learn from the past, right? To say, we don't want to repeat the kind of problem of a hierarchy where um, somebody like Martin Luther King, for example, is um, misrepresented as being the embodiment of the whole movement. And so his point of view is the only point of view somehow that matters. Um, so they wanted to follow a, a different kind of model, which is um, a model that was um, in terms of the black freedom movement, um, perhaps first presented by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Commission, right? Sort of the, the youth organization within um, the black freedom movement of the mid 20th century, and was certainly taken up um, within the women's movement. and black feminism as well as mainstream feminism often had um, sort of a, a sense that they didn't want to put anyone forward as the one representative of the group, that they mm -hmm. wanted to come to decisions through um, consciousness raising, right? Long discussions of, you know, this is my point of view. What's your point of view? I'm coming to it from this perspective. I'm, I'm coming to this question from these experiences. What have your experiences been? Right, so that they come to a consensus. And then they might, for the moment, say, okay, you're going to do this job of talking to the media in this moment, but next time we're gonna have somebody else talk to the media. Um, and so very much um, the um, National Women's Studies Association has followed that model growing out of feminism and Black Lives Matter certainly extended that um, to the point that, um, a lot of a lot of the press has 
and the public have been frustrated with Black Lives Matter because they're like, who are your leaders? And they're like, we're all the leaders. <laughs> um, and I recognize that that makes it difficult to sort of pin them down in the way that we normally think of things, but we're thinking of things through a hierarchy, whereas they are moving against the whole notion of hierarchy. hierarchy. Um, and I admire that, I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what we're, this is the future. So yeah. we, let, <laughs> we need to let the people that we're turning the future over to have their point of view and share it. So um, in some ways it's exciting to see how people envision the future. And so um, that's part of it. Uh, actually, one of them was a comment to say, thank you so much for moving beyond Martin Luther King, that this is, <laughs> we, we, that's something we all know about. That is something we learned about, but to move beyond, that's really one of the first steps in having this uh, and a better understanding. Um, so what do you think is the reason for the under repression, representation of IDB Wells and Sojourner Truth in the history um, for the impact they laid uh, on the Black empowering movement in the United States? Well, um, I think that, I mean, for one thing, there's just simple sexism, right? Um, in history, as in every other aspect of life, where, you know, people tend to point to the men um, and they tend to assume that the man is going to be the leader and do the important things. And that results or has resulted in, for example, the archive, right? The main material that historians use to do our work um, is, uh, you know, what, you, what do you think to preserve, right? As you're going through your, I don't know, as you're going through the trunks of your grandmother after she has passed away and you're, you know, preserving, what are you gonna keep and what are you gonna throw out, right? Are you going to keep her grocery lists? Um, probably not. Are you, know, are you going to keep your grandfather's journals that she kept? Probably so, right? You know, but do you take the time to notice that alongside the weekly grocery list, your grandmother made little notes in the margins and et cetera? Mm -hmm. Maybe you do and maybe you don't. It has been only recently that uh, archivists and those who preserve those kinds of things and historians have thought to pay attention. Right, and um, Ida B. Wells is somebody who um, was aware of that kind of dynamic, and she made a point of keeping a journal, of trying to preserve her her own legacy. Um, but she was also, as I mentioned before, kind of difficult to deal with, um, and a lot of people <laughs> found her um, uh, sort of uh, too much to take. Right, because she had a huge personality. Um, and people would sort of exclude her if they could, you know, they were like, ah, eh, you've got a loud voice. Um, and so I think a combination of sexism alongside the fact that people like Mary Church Terrell and um, W.E.B. Du Bois um, and others, other names that we might know, uh, Booker T. Washington, they didn't like her personally. Right, and so they tended to to exclude her, and therefore it has taken sort of a um, a major effort in the last ten to fifteen years to sort of recover her story, mm -hmm. and especially beyond the story of her anti lynching campaign, which happened mostly when she was young, but she had a long career after that, and so um, and it's you know things like this Alpha Suffrage Club in the nineteen thirteen March and those kinds of things um, are known in Chicago, if you're paying attention to Chicago history, but um, they've only recently been brought forward through a larger story. And you know, that's, Turner, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that's in some ways the same story you hear with Trotter. I mean, he wasn't people, not just Wilson, he wasn't liked among his peers. And for right. that, you don't hear the story. So, um, that's interesting. It's, it's almost like how you were accepted at your time kind of uh, makes you propelled into the future into, into we learn about you in history or not. Um, it's interesting, fascinating. Um, so we have a couple more questions. My gosh, we have a lot more questions. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have to have a part two. Um, one of the questions that came up is what is the biggest part of racism? Uh, you and I talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, 
but I'd like for you to share that with, uh, with the crowd. What is the biggest part of racism? We talked um, about um, the finances of it. And you mentioned that a little bit oh. earlier oh, yeah. about women and their finances and how that is, uh, they, we stay under by not having the finances. Um, do you want to share with the group a little bit about that? Yes. Um, yesterday we, we were talking about um, segregation, um, uh, Jim Crow segregation and, um, you know, why, uh, I guess Woodrow Wilson's efforts ar around uh, segregating DC and federal works and et cetera. Um, and I think that uh, oftentimes when we think about segregation or we think about Jim Crow, we look at, you know, it's so, it's such a, uh, we get such a great photograph if we photograph the water fountain that says whites only or, you know, colored or Negro or whatever, right? Um, or, you know, the ladies room versus the bathroom for, colored women, right? <laughs> like these kinds of differences, right? Um, and those, those are important, um, but people tend from those photographs and those images to get the impression that segregation was mostly about dignity um, or about respectability, which it was, but it was also very much about money. It was about who could earn what, who had access to what. So, you know, I mentioned yesterday that the, um, the job ads in the newspaper um, were entirely segregated. They were segregated by gender as well as by race. And so you would have jobs that were for white men, jobs for white women, jobs for black men, jobs for black women, right? And the ones that were for black people were, you could earn much, much less, just as the white women could not earn as much as the white men, and black women could not earn as nearly as much as the white women, and et cetera, right? Um, and so the jobs for black women over in this part of the newspaper were overwhelmingly, um, you know, for housework, uh, childcare, uh, cooking, these kinds of things, right? Cleaning, washerwomen, you know, um, very menial kinds of jobs that didn't earn much at all, right? And black men could only get so high um, in the wage economy and couldn't be promoted and these kinds of things. Um, and segregation enforced that and maintained it. And not only with, you know, the kinds of signs that you would find in the South, but also throughout the nation and what you could access and what opportunities you could, um, you could take and to try to make uh, a life for yourself and to support your family. And of course that plays out into the present um, with the ongoing wealth gap, right? Um, so that comes gap. up our last question, um, and that is, uh, because that is where we are today, that there, there is a gap, and it does have to come back to the original question of, of segregation and then money, um, and how, and, and opportunity for our advancement. Uh, and that, this question has now come in three times, four times. What do you think needs to happen now, and what is essential for change to occur? Right. Well, <laughs> um, I think we have an opportunity with this pandemic, right? We are witnessing, you know, um, all of these problems, right? That not only people of color, but the poor at large are suffering the pandemic much more so um, than those who are more um, economically secure. We have, you know, a, pro a problem where, you know, this sort of domino effect where individuals were fired from their jobs and so they can't pay their rent or they can't pay their mortgage and so the uh, country has this solution the federal government says okay well we'll send you you know a couple thousand dollars to make it through the next few months um, but it seems to me that the real or, or a much more permanent uh, possibility is to recognize hey we have a problem when the majority of society can't make it a few months without their wages, right? Maybe we should have a society in which you have uh, access to um, housing that is uh, that that fulfills your needs. Maybe you have access to water. Maybe you have access to food, the things that you need to sustain yourself, and certainly medical care, right? 
So um, having our basic needs met is really one of the first things that we need to do. Yeah, it's sort of as a baseline across our society um, and then work from there. Erin, Dr. Chapman, thank you so much. This has really been wonderful to have you join us. And thank you all of our uh, listeners and viewers who've tuned in today. Um, we plan to continue this conversation. As I said, uh, July 14th is a Tuesday. It will be uh, Dr. Eric Yellen writing uh, his book on racism in the nation's service. Um, I welcome you to join us. These talks are free if you'd like to make a donation and for anyone who has made a donation, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. But tell your friends, keep looking. We'll send out some more information about these talks. And again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it and have a great and safe afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.